Welcome to the Future of Sharing, a new series where we're going to be looking at how can we make the sharing economy work for everyone. I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of reInvent. And today we have an interview with Michelle Miller, who is co-founder, co-director of coworker.org. A lot of co's in there. We're going to have to untangle all the co's coming up here. Uh, she is essentially going to give us insight into the sharing economy, uh, a little bit more from the people who work in the, in the sharing economy's perspective, and she is uh, going to help elucidate a lot of things from that perspective today. So welcome. Thanks for coming in here and uh, joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, one thing you might, you might just explain at the start is what, what is Coworker? Just for people that wouldn't know it, explain it a little bit about what, what do you do? So coworker.org is a digital platform for worker voice. Um, we support uh, workers anywhere in the world who want to start a campaign to change uh, conditions inside their workplace. And we help them use social media and digital networks to start to build uh, decentralized networks of their fellow employees from around the world to be sources of new forms of advocacy inside corporations. Um, and we're really a mass experiment with co-designing the future of the labor movement, um, right with workers at the center of that process. So you deal with workers in all kinds of sectors of the economy. It's not just the sharing economy or the gig economy per se. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, um, more generally, what we really specialize in are decentralized workplaces. So that's on-demand platforms in the sharing economy. That's um, franchises. You know, our biggest network are Starbucks baristas. We have about 27,000 baristas from around the world using the platform. Um, uh, companies on the supply chain, these sort of places where there are multiple uh, small spaces where groups of workers are working um, that can be connected by a digital platform to really match the scale of their company. Well, I know Tim O'Reilly had a, had a conference in uh, kind of working on the future of work essentially last fall. And I remember he was talking about how in many, we've, we've, it's been common practice to talk about deconstructing the corporation and how the kind of economy is going and that we're kind of seeing these decentralized functions of the, of, of the corporation kind of being taken over by smaller and smaller units. And he kind of made a comparison to your outfit of you're kind of de deconstructing the union or something. Is that, is that a fair kind of description of what you're trying to do? And maybe explain a little, a little bit more. Yeah, um, I actually loved that description um, from Tim. So, you know, it, it's really helpful to talk about how and why we got started. Um, and within that really contains what we're trying to do. So. Um, my co-founder, Jess Kutch, and I met each other inside the traditional trade union movement. We worked at a labor union called SEIU and had been frustrated at our inability to really reach most workers um, since about 6% of the private sector is in a union. There's 94% of the workforce that has no access to any kind of advocacy tools. Um, but at the same time that we were sort of having this conversation in 2011 and in 2012, we started to see workers themselves using popular technology tools to really recreate some of the um, processes that unions had actually been engaging in for years. So what we would see would be that they would create Facebook groups where they would connect with one another and talk about issues that were important to them. They would launch change.org petitions. They would have Reddit threads where they would share info and, and data um, and, and through those um, efforts led by workers themselves, where they really articulated the thing that was the most important thing to them, um, we started to see some patterns emerging. One was that um, employees and workers at companies really had their finger on the pulse of um, the things that were most important and most resonant for them. And that um, when they would be able to articulate them, thousands of their coworkers would often swarm around that issue. Um, and that those workers would often take other leadership roles. So someone would volunteer to talk to the media. Someone would volunteer to do the petition delivery. Someone would um, be the person who was sort of facilitating discussion in social media about the issue, that these, these leaders would emerge out of the crowd. Um, and that uh, the media would tell the stories of these campaigns, really from the voices of workers, because that was... Um, the richest content that was being presented. Um, and then we would also see that sometimes they would win, uh, which was incredible to us. Um, but what we weren't seeing was the long-term infrastructure that actually kept the networks together. So they were very ephemeral. They would sort of form around an issue. They would be working together for six weeks, and then they would dissipate. 
And what we wanted to figure out was, what is the combination of technology infrastructure and expert support that um, could help these networks sustain over time um, and help people really opt in and opt out of leadership as it fit their lives, opt in and opt out of workplace activism as it made sense for their jobs, and start to form the kinds of 21st century unions that make sense in an agile economy. Um, and so that's really where we started. We started with that set of questions. And when I think about this concept of, of deconstructing the union, I do really think of starting with the worker who wants something different and figuring out like what are the things that we can give to them that help them make that different thing come to fruition. And as we identify that in partnership with those workers, we start to see the seeds of what is the future form or multiple future forms for people to have a voice in their workplaces. Interesting. Now, um, when you say, what, what's the time frame? You, you, what, give me a little sense of when this was starting and things like that. Dates. Sure. Not yeah. little dates, but years. Kind of, what, what are we talking here? Yeah, so we launched in January of 2013. Um, so we've been around for about three years. Um, since then, we've grown. We have about 350,000 subscribers, um, which are people that have signed on to campaigns. And we have employee networks, which are these, these decentralized digital networks of of employees um, inside. Um, we, we consider a robust network to be a thousand workers or more. So we have a thousand workers or more in 15 different companies. Um, so like I said, well, uh, Starbucks is our largest network at 27,000. We have um, 20,000 American airline employees, 5,000 Uber drivers, um, 3,000 Wells Fargo bank tellers. So, you know, the, the sizes vary, 10,000 Darden restaurant employees. Um, and they've all joined through um, efforts led by their coworkers. And then in follow-up participated in surveys and polls about their working conditions, become media volunteers, um, hosted discussions online, joined conference calls, taken a, a variety of other actions um, as part of their participation in their networks. So it sounds to me, again, for the sake of this discussion, there's, there's a general economy where people are working at United Airlines or something, full-time full employees at some level. And then there's kind of the Starbucks situation. I don't know if they're a contract or whatever, maybe gig economy people. We're trying to figure out, again, in, in the scope of this series, is really the sharing economy. So yeah. for, from your point of view, how do you kind of define the subset of, of kind of situations in the sharing economy that would be distinct maybe from worrying about, you know, organizing people in United Airlines or even Starbucks? Yeah, I mean, so um, we started working with Uber drivers about a year ago, which has been the main um, group of workers within the on-demand economy that we've specifically run campaigns in partnership with. Although we, we do have um, some Postmates delivery drivers who've also run a campaign. Um, and I would say, um, you know, there are similarities and there are differences uh, with these workers and workers in the rest of the economy. I think anybody who's doing work in a, on a part-time basis, um, whether or not, uh, we don't distinguish between whether or not you're a full-time employee or a 1099 worker. We basically, whoever wants to come can come and we'll work with them. Um, and we, what we see is that, uh, the, the number one issue among um, drivers in the on-demand economy or workers in the on-demand economy is the unpredictability of, of their wages, uh, unpredictability of scheduling, and so really trying and then being able to find one another. So we play this sort of aggregator function um, so that people can actually start to find one another um, and network together since their um, workplaces are so deeply dispersed and so individualized. And then to start to come up with solutions to um, the uh, things in their lives that are the most unpredictable. And the reason that the aggregation um, can really help with managing the unpredictability of working in this particular sector of the economy is that um, what's missing so much is information about what other people are experiencing. And once you start to be able to aggregate that information or really tap into the I would say like the aggregate worker brain within that, that seg sector, um, you're able to make smarter and more informed decisions about the ways in which you're choosing to work, the times in which you're choosing to work, the things that you might want to change about the app or the experience with the platform. But you don't take the function of a 
union and literally go to Uber or go to some situation. You're just at this stage. You're just kind of connecting up people that are are, are, are participating in this economy for for better or worse. They like it. They don't like it. Whatever. It's the different issues around. It. Yeah. For now, we are really performing an aggregation and support function. Um, our goal is to eventually, you know, um, right now, as we can see, um, if you go to our site, it's a very basic, very, very basic technology infrastructure that's designed for campaigning. Um, our goal is to actually uh, enhance that infrastructure so that workers can start to find one another and talk to one another right on the site without mediation from coworker.org staff. Um, and so the goal will eventually be that the networks of workers are able to start to determine what their set of demands might be for a platform and then go to that platform and negotiate them themselves. That we would, we do not do any negotiation um, on behalf of workers. So we don't function like a union in that way. Um, instead, we create the space for workers to sort of come together and actually be able to do that for themselves. And I think in the on-demand economy, Creating that kind of structure is going to be really important because, you know, these workers are dispersed all around the world and they are working truly as individuals um, to perform the tasks that they're completing and working on multiple platforms. So you use the name, uh, you've used it several times, on-demand. Would you say on-demand economy is, is synonymous with the, what we would call the sharing economy or, or is it more the gig economy or how, how do you, I mean, there's so many different words here. I'm just kind of curious how you see that. Yeah, I, um, I choose on demand because it feels the most accurate to me. I am using it to describe the sharing economy and the gig, the gig economy feels a bit pejorative. I suppose that on demand also does, um, but I think that it, it speaks, I use that phrase because it speaks to the experience of both the worker and the consumer. You can get work on demand and you can get uh, what you need on demand. Um, and so it's, it speaks to the immediacy of the platform. Um, and I, I think that when you think about what coworker is, we are in some ways an on-demand platform for workers. You know, you can start a campaign and you will get help from us rather quickly. So just, just given that you mentioned, you know, the, the gig economy has this pejorative term. So your attitude based on who you're talking with and your folks in your network and also your own perspective is, is that this is this this evolution of the economy is I guess a neutral thing or a good thing or or or, or how do you kind of or a negative thing? It's interesting. Just you know, people would just just tell us where you're coming from when you when you think about that kind of this new kind of manifestation of the economy from your point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I maybe I start from neutrality, um, and I, because I think that there are there is a lot of potential offered by changing the ways in which we work and the ways in which we relate to our jobs. Um, and obviously, you know, the thing that folks um, in the sharing economy and on-demand economy talk about a lot is this sense of flexibility and individual agency over our time. And I think that for workers, if you look at labor history, there is a long history of workers in traditional work sites really feeling like they want more agency over their time. They want to be able to use their brains to make decisions. They want to have an active role in determining the structure of their day. And so it, that, the fact that that is on the table is incredible to me. Um, and I think is, again, very um, exciting about the opportunity it provides. Um, but I, I also think that the distance between sort of utopia and dystopia in this economy is the agency that workers actually have over making that determination. And when you pair uh, this incredible flexibility with subpar wages, or you pair it with um, having to take on individual debt or additional individual risks to actually be able to work in the economy, then you're undercutting what is incredible and exciting about the potential for agency over your time. And so um, when, from my perspective, I think we have a possibly have a, a once in a generation chance since the industrial revolution to decide what work's going to be. I can't not be excited about that, but I also want to make sure that we're figuring out how workers are at the center of shaping that and determining that and making sure that um, as these platforms evolve, that they really have a say in what the best working conditions for them are um, instead of 
uh, situation in which we determine the future of work or we determine the future of how the algorithms operate or how the platforms operate based on the interests of VC investors only. So that's really, you know, where I come into this conversation. So, um, so full of promise and, and a lot of potential, um, but kind of understanding that there's transitional problems here and things we got to kind of work through. I mean, in many respects, that's kind of where we're coming from in this, um, in this series. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we're pulling people like yourself from all different perspectives is to kind of figure out, there is a moment here to figure this out. Let's figure it out and figure it out right and make it work for everybody. I mean, that's literally the premise of what we're trying to pull off here. But so, so let's go back to the bigger, um, you, you started talking about once in a generation. I've actually seen you refer to it as once a century or something kind of up here. So, so for people that don't really understand that, uh, unpack that a little bit. What, what, what's going on that's such a big deal here? What, what's, what, why, how do we get to here? What's the big picture opportunity that's happening here that, from your perspective? Is there a way you talk about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I, um, I actually think that what's happening has been happening for about 20 years, um, which is the, the decoupling of work from the full time day, um, which has been brought on heavily by technology, but in changes in the ways that firms are, are, are structured. Um, the um, folks that have been organizing guest workers and temporary workers and contingent workers have been talking about this and freelancers obviously have been talking about this for years and years. Um, I think that the moment that we're in, though, is that um, uh, the on-demand economy and the platforms have made, have um, created a situation which we're all kind of experiencing this, both as consumers and as workers um, at once. We're, we're actually deeply experiencing this possibility and understanding that, you know, by 2020, half of us are going to be freelancing. Um, we're, and we're beginning to wrestle with the ripple effects of what it means um, for this, for the workplace to be structured in this way. The last time we wrestled with this was in 1935 when the NLRA was passed. Um, and a, a thing that I learned from Wilma Liebman, uh, who was the board chair of the National Labor Relations Board, um, was that it was actually in a moment when, um, it was a sort of rare moment when um, work was becoming much more highly centralized than it ever had been, and we designed a system of supporting workers based on a moment of high centralization in, in the manufacturing and industrial age um, that actually didn't quite reflect how people had been working from throughout the 19th century and up until about the early part of the 20th century. Um, and so it actually feels like we're returning in some ways to how people have been accessing work for a long time, that we're hyper aware of the fact that that system doesn't work. The actual structures of the system from the way that you access a federal agency and figure out if your health and safety uh, regulations have been violated to the way that you file a unfair labor practice to the way that you form a union to the way that you even get a job, all of those things have been um, deconstructed and are, are changing. And so as we're wrestling with how to, um, how to repair these old systems, uh, I think that, we're, that people are hungry for a conversation about how work is actually quite different for a lot of people. I feel like that was like not my best answer. I, and what I'm really thinking about is like, we're also doing this in the context of the fact that we're having a national conversation, a global conversation about income inequality. And so you pair those two things together where people are frustrated about the stagnation of their wages and their inability to get ahead. They are confounded by the role that Wall Street's been playing in the economy, and there's this sort of metaphysical sense that it's not fair, but no real sense of how it's not fair. Um, and then you have these opportunities to access work in ways that nobody ever imagined before. And all of that is sort of creating a moment in which um, elected officials and thought leaders and organizers are actually willing to sit down and think differently about what work can be. That's awesome. No, um, that's very, I, I like how you laid that out. That's actually quite a, quite a, it's a difficult thing to explain, but you're, you're absolutely right. There, there, we seem to be at some kind of historical juncture where there's almost a critical mass and we're at some kind of moment here. Again, mm -hmm. it's kind of one of the premises of this series, which is there's some window here, whether it's two, three, five years, who knows what, but anyhow, relatively short period of time here where these disruptions have gotten to the point where something's going to happen. It could be, and it could go very badly in terms of the wrong responses to kind of 
which undermines a lot of the good things that I think are emerging from these new ways of doing work. Uh, or it could actually exacerbate the problems. Anyhow, there's a, there's a lot of moments, it's a, it's a moment of fraught with a lot of opportunity, but also some, some real, you know, caution here too, or some worry. And that, I think that's partly what we're trying to pull off here. So, um, so you mentioned it by 2020, maybe 50% of us, when you say freelancers, I mean, you mean that, because when people see freelance, it's like, oh, once in a while I do something. You mean the main way that people will get paid will be through contract work when they aren't employees. Is that, is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, Socket Sony from the Guest Workers Alliance often talks about how the trend toward work is going, work had for a long time been long periods of full-time employment interrupted by very short periods of unemployment. And then it's going to go the opposite way. We're going to have these very long periods of contingent short-term employment and then short um, periods of uh, having a single job that we do. Um, and I think that, and so I, my prediction is um, that the 50% and more are going to be accessing work, work that currently right now is full-time work, are going to be accessing an enormous amount of their work through a series of platforms. Um, and that the concept of having one employer who is responsible for providing for the social safety net that sits underneath of you is going to go by the wayside. And again, just to flesh this out, we aren't talking some always low wage kind of workers. You're, you're talking like um, professionals or, you know, people who currently are, you know, it, it, in fact, you see it in the movie industry, you see it in the media industry, you see it in all kinds of places already that people make their living through consistent contracts, but they aren't, but they're making a good living and they're, you know, living well and the whole kind of thing. So, so you you mean at all levels, you're not talking about some farm workers or something. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about on all levels. I mean, there, I, the, you know, uh, the, there's a platform for giving legal advice. Um, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, uh, the Institute for the Future did that test with iCEO where they figured out that you could automate the task distribution currently performed by middle management. Um, that, you know, there are a lot of things that are happening where um, the jobs that, that might have looked, I think that generally we assume the white collar jobs and white collar professionals are always safe from disruptions in the economy. And I don't think that that's what's gonna be the case here. I think that we're all going to be, uh, or a lot of us are going to be working very differently. I mean, you could imagine nurses working. Nurses work on call already. They work on call as employees of a hospital, but you could change that system pretty quickly um, and have a platform, a community platform where nurses are distributed to hospitals based on need. I don't know that that's the best idea. Uh, it scares me, <laughs> but uh, I'm not generally very dystopian, but I'm not sure about that one. Uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're going to see that. And I think that is going to just be the way in which we work. This is just a structure and the structure is changing. Agreed. I actually agree. So, so, so this is happening. You're neutral, if, it, if anything, optimistic, it feels like about it, the, the, about that this is a, generally a good thing, or at least it's moving in a direction that could be a good thing. Is that fair enough to say that from your point of view? Or are you kind of more worried or more, more, more? more encouraged by where things are going here? I am, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm not worried. Uh, I mean, I'm concerned about implications for workers, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it could be good. Um, but it's always like, it can be good if we're, we are figuring out how workers have a say in this. You know what I mean? So I think that all of the, I, the yes, I think that it could be encouraging and it could be good and it could be, and I'm probably a more optimist. I'm definitely more optimistic than pessimistic. I'm a little bit more optimistic than neutral. Um, and it's all contingent on if we can figure out how to really thoughtfully create an avenue for independent worker voice in the context of this. Um, that's the that's the key. Okay, so so let's think of this. From what I'm hearing from you, there, there's three major stakeholders in this, you could say, or players in this, in this unfolding reinvention of the system. Uh, you've made implications uh, that clearly the companies uh, who have control over a lot of the aspects of where this goes have to be willing to kind of 
play ball and be involved and involved and compromise and all the things. So that's one crew. There's clearly the, 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 the um, workers, as you mentioned. But I, again, stressing, when you hear workers, sometimes people think working class or they think, you're just saying everybody who works at some yeah. level or, or, a, or a growing number of people who work, high and low income folks, really. Yes, absolutely. Um, some kind of say in that, have to be willing to engage it positively and kind of work with it. And then the third one is this kind of government regulators uh, at kind of federal, state, and local level. So is that kind of a schematic way to understand it? There's really three major folks that have to come together in some way, or, or do you think of it any differently than that? Yeah, no, I think that that sounds about right. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. And I, I note your your point on the worker thing. Man, I wish I could find a better word. <laughs> but uh, it's been three years and we still have it. So um, citizens, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, it's a tricky one. I, I totally, I feel your pain. As We're always trying to figure out how to, how to call things things. But I, I just want to reiterate for this interview that, and for people like maybe watching this, that, you know, it's not like, low wage workers this is the way work is going to go for many people so people have to tune in now to how does that system work not just for others but for them if they're coming from those those other higher higher kind of paying jobs for example uh, and this isn't even touching on and i don't know if we want to go there but we're not even talking about the automation of ai robotics and you know that whole thing we're just talking the human economy right now right mm -hmm. Correct. Or, or do you have reflections on that, on, on how the, 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 the do, you, do you spend any time thinking about the, the AI robotics kind of impact on, on these, this, this whole thing? I think about it a little bit. I mean, I, um, again, I come from a slightly a traditional labor perspective, which is that um, we need to figure out how people have meaningful work um, and uh, feel that what they are contributing is, is meaningful. Um, and I would say that uh, there are a lot of the jobs that these robots are going to be replacing that are really terrible jobs. Over the road trucking is not a good, is like, is a really unhealthy job. Um, and I, uh, I love Teamsters and I love truck drivers, um, but those are really hard jobs. They're taxing on our bodies, they're taxing on people's well being, they're taxing on the environment. And so when we think about the transition, to, to self-driving cars and the loss of that industry, I think we need to be thoughtful about where folks go and the structure that we create for them to thrive and survive. But I don't mourn the loss of jobs that are quite dangerous. And I, I have to say, I come from West Virginia, which is a place where we are losing an enormous amount right now. And so I, I, and I get very angry when people say they just need to accept it and move on because I know what it looks like from a very personal perspective, what it means to lose everything, to change the economy. But I also think that we can, we can do better for people losing their jobs to robotics than we've done for people in Appalachia. Maybe that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I see it coming. I think it's gonna be extraordinarily disruptive. And in the same way that we have a job to do around centering the future of the, of the structure of work around what workers need, we can create an economy that serves people who are not gonna be doing the same jobs. There's plenty of work to do in the tangible world that robots can't do. We can figure out how to value that work and pay people a decent wage for it or supplement it with a universal basic income um, and, and not make this a disaster. Okay, so let's go to the policy ideas. So, so we've got the three players. Let's, let's focus on, because a lot of what we're focusing on this, in this series is, is uh, evolving policy. Mm -hmm. um, and we're frankly, particularly looking at the city level, but I understand particularly from where you're coming from, it probably has a lot of work needs to be done at the federal and state level. But just as an overview, can you give us the kinds of things that really have to be rethought, maybe, maybe starting at the federal and moving down to the city? Um, like mm -hmm. just your wish list or your, your kind of to-do list or how, I don't know how you think about it, but like what are the kinds of things that you think really have to be fundamentally rethought in this new context? So, um, I mean, the, the big public conversation, um, which I think is right, is about the, the benefit system and access to um, social insurance and the, the social benefits associated that are currently tied directly to your, 
being a full-time employee. So access to disability, to workers' comp, um, to paying into social security in a reasonable way, um, all of those things that come from being a full-time employee that aren't available to freelancers. We need a portable benefit system. Um, and I, you know, I know that there is a lot of conversation about how that's shaped. And I, I would say really strongly that the whatever comes of the system, it needs to be, you know, uh, managed by the government, but overseen by some kind of independent third party that's not beholden to um, the companies or the the workers. That it's a social. It's a, it's sort of. Um, so it's there, and and secondly, that um, we need to create a system that that we we need to figure out how platforms pay into that system. So there's been some talk about that um, that you could create structures that workers themselves just pay into. It's actually not economically feasible unless uh, platforms are participating into paying into these systems of protection for workers. And frankly, it's a civic responsibility if you are operating in this country. Um, and you are making money off of this country, you should be paying into the system um, that supports the, the workers that are working on your platform. So I would say that's job number one. Um, I am uh, the, I think, I don't know how we do this, um, but I think that the government um, and policymakers need to get far more savvy about the way that um, algorithmic decision-making works and um, the way that, um, you know, working conditions are actually shaped by um, de decisions made by algorithms um, and that there may be some way in which um, uh, we're regulating workers' rights and the rights of consumers on the platforms through, um, through understanding algorithms and algorithmic regulation um, in a different way that we've never actually done before in our lives. Um, and then I, I think that we need to take um, the, the data question um, pretty seriously about like how workers um, who, I, I, you know, I think about it as in the same way that benefits should be portable, the data that is produced by the work that you create should also be portable. Um, so if you worked on Uber and Lyft and then a new platform came up for you to drive on, uh, at the federal level, we need to be figuring out how you can take your um, reputation with you when you move to another platform so that you have maximum mobility in a, what is supposed to be a free market economy and you're not, you're not tied to one platform because if you move to the next platform, it's like you're starting from scratch. So I think of those three, those really rooted in um, all aspects of portability and, and being able to move around. Um, and then I, you know, I'm not an expert at city level regulation to be really very blunt. Um, and so I think I am not even gonna try. I'm not gonna expound on the city level regulation question. So, so, so okay, so that's fine. Um, and um, so, so all those ones you just mentioned would be either federal or state. Is that what you're saying? Because I could, I could parse through that a little bit. I mean, some of them clearly, if you're talking about reworking Social Security, and you know, there, there's clearly some federal side of this. But, um, uh, but also, you could imagine states trying these ahead of other states. Um, yes. Yeah. Going through this, I mean, even the data question. It's interesting. Whether I guess that would have to be a state thing, potentially a city. I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting, just who does what. But um, those are all. Um, but what I, just to clarify from you, you're seeing those as federal and state level things, but to go down to the real locality seems like a stretch uh, for those at least ones that you teed up there. I, I guess, I mean, I'm thinking about it more now and I don't see why you couldn't test some of that at the city level. And they are testing benefits at the city level with Uber drivers in New York with the freelancers union. So I think you could test some of that at the city level. I amend, I amend my comment. <laughs> um, and I, I forgot one thing, which is, or two things which are very, very important, um, not quite connected to benefits, but um, we need to figure out what a wage floor looks like um, for people that are working on the platforms. Uh, because uh, I think we made a decision in this country uh, many, many years ago that there needs to be a minimum wage and we need to make sure that people are meeting a minimum wage for work. Um, and the, the way in which we're accessing work on platforms is makes it difficult to really actually regulate that in the current framework. Um, and then we need to figure out 
um, ways of regulating people's health and safety as they're, especially in platforms when you are engaging with strangers as individuals in their homes. Um, uh, how do we create a regulatory system that protects people um, when they're doing that kind of very micro one-on-one -on -one work? Um, or they're working, they're doing gig work out of their homes, or there's a number of health and safety implications to not having a, to having casualized workplaces that I feel like we have not, we, when I say we, I mean we on the labor side have not actually even dug into, but that are probably going to be pretty important. Could, could you be a little, I mean, I, I'm, could you be a little more, I guess visceral about that, like meaning, what's give an example of 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 of, of that last category of things? Um, are, you, you if you're working on your own home, there's there's an issue there, but it's kind of your own home. But are you saying something like if you're um, sharing your home and someone's using your home, that that you'd have to kind of think about how does how do we do health and safety in that context, or would you talk more about what you meant there? Yeah, I'm I'm ta I'm thinking specifically about um, you know platforms like Handy or TaskRabbit where you're we're sending people into other people's homes um, to perform jobs um, that are you know if you're cleaning there are there are cleaning chemicals that are dangerous and people who are professional cleaners have those things regulated and there are things that you can use and things that you can't use. Um, you, uh, you know, if you're washing windows, for example, there are safety regulations about how you're supposed to wash windows if you're standing on the outside of a building. Um, uh, there, in terms of like a person performing repairs inside the home that you, that you hire, like, I mean, that is a, that's a problem anyway, like the construction business already has these problems, but I think that, um, they, it's, it's, uh, it's exacerbated by, um, you know, this sort of much more casual relationship between um, when between us when we're hiring people off of platforms to do work um, and non-regulated spaces. So that's really what I'm thinking about, and also, uh, you know, training. So like, if we're get if we're accessing work on demand, um, and we can just pick something up and do it, uh, do our have we have I been trained to use that piece of equipment? Uh, am I going to hurt myself? Um, if you're if you're going and using, you know, I don't I don't I'm going to get into something I really don't know. But like, are maker spaces regulated by OSHA? Uh, probably not. I don't know if they should be in the way that OSHA is currently constructed. But it wouldn't be a bad idea for us to start thinking about the multiple places in which people are accessing work and making sure that they're safe for people. Um, and that's a huge job. Uh, and the way that OSHA is currently structured, they're not structured to be able to take something like that on. Because you also don't want to be onerous and you don't want to stifle um, innovation and excitement and people trying new things uh, with regulations that are overbearing. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess someone could hear those level of changes and feel, oh my God, that's, that's such a fundamental rethink at so many levels um it seemed very daunting i mean but on the other hand you seem very optimistic about it or at least uh, relatively positive and can do let's say you have, you seem to have a can do attitude that that's all, it's all doable somehow is that uh, yeah i totally feel it's doable we can do that if yeah. we can't what are we doing <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah i do think it's doable it requires will and commitment and um, an openness on all three of those sort of entities that you've talked about to, to really make this work and to listen to one another, but we absolutely can do it. And it's overdue because most of those systems were not working to their full capacity before the uh, emergence of the sharing economy. So let's take it as a moment. Yeah, no, I love the idea. I share your spirit, by the way, too. Um, uh, well, another thing to think about is you, you made reference, and maybe you know more about this than someone watching this. Um, I mean, so many of these things we didn't have prior to, you, you made the reference to 1936, um, and, uh, and we created them then out of nothing, and we kind of used the way we kind of dealt with them then, pretty much federal bureaucracies and centralized control and kind of standardization of regulations. I mean, a lot of the things that are the kind of hallmark of that mid-20th century kind of post- World War II boom kind of world 
mm-hmm. kind of created this system. And I guess what you're kind of saying is um, that world is kind of going away, it has gone away, it's been breaking down, and we got this new kind of world. It's a similar moment where we just got to kind of roll up our sleeves and do something similar. Is that, is that, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth, but is that kind of where you're coming from? No, that's totally where I'm coming from. Um, and that came, that moment came, uh, one, that moment came because the entire economy had collapsed. Um, it'd be great if we didn't ha- let that happen again. Um, but that moment also came um, from the workers' perspective out of, you know, 15 to 20 years or more of people trying a lot of different things. My co-founder articulates this better than I do, but the labor movement of the late 19th century and early 20th century was a hub of innovation and in trying all kinds of new things. And by trying all of those new things, um, they really seeded what became the National Labor Relations Act. And part of the business response to them trying all of those new things was to say to FDR, can we figure out like one way to manage this instead of 25 ways to manage this? And so it was it was both workers experimenting with new forms and really demanding that um, we create a system through which they can negotiate with their employees um, that we got the NLRA. I think we can do it again. And maybe right. this time we can do it more flexibly. <laughs> more flexibly. Well, again, we've got tools, these incredible computer networks and things that are, you know, just were magic compared to what they had back then. Mm-hmm. Um, I often kind of raise that as like, can you imagine, you know, handing an iPhone to, to FDR and saying, you know, you can ask any question in the world and get all the, world, <laughs> the answers prioritized in a second, you know, and it would have just blown their minds, that kind of, yeah. that kind of capability. Um, are there any lessons, insights from there, from that period that would be applicable today? I mean, you kind of made that analogy, but um, besides the need to crash the economy, let's say we could, although in some respects you could say the economy has crashed, uh, right. certainly with the Great Recession, certainly with the crash of the housing, uh, certainly, you know, there, there's a feeling that, um, you know, maybe not quite as bad as the Great Depression, but we're, we're not exactly, there is a kind of moment that's made people think hard about this stuff. Um, but, but anyhow, any, any uh, insights in terms of what we might think about as we kind of wind down the interview here about going into this next phase? Yeah, um, I mean, lessons, I would say from that era, um, you know, the, like I said, people were trying everything. Um, there was the, the, the garment workers union had um, housing that they were building, like cooperative housing, basically. Um, that they were building for members, people, there were experiments with company unions, there were um, a lot of experiments with, uh, you know, the Knights of Labor with like uh, uh, cooperatives or using fraternal orders to actually organize people economically, like thinking really economically instead of job-based about how people might form networks and collectives. Um, and then I would say the, the, the lesson from that era not to take with us was that one of the real limits of the National Labor Relations Act was that it was exclusionary. And so it excluded farm workers, it excluded domestic laborers, it excluded, uh, if you read between the lines, it basically excluded people of color and women. Um, And it really narrowed who got to benefit from the economy. So when we're thinking about what this next system is, we need to be thinking about everybody and how we create something that benefits as many people as possible and doesn't prioritize one kind of work over the other because that's how you get into situations um, that limit people's ability to change the way that they're working. Totally get it. Um, so now you made this up now, Jane, as we kind of, again, um, as we're gonna be closing here pretty soon here, you talk about this long lead time of experimentation and then eventually kind of came to fruition in the, in the kind of mid thirties. Do you, where do you feel we are in this, in, in the kind of analogy, not that it all has to be exactly parallel, but um, do you feel we're close to some kind of resolution or we're kind of in the early experimental phase or, or, or what, what's, what, what's your, when you look out in the next five or 10 years here, are, we, are you thinking it's going to get solved in short term, long term, we're in the early days, mid days moment of, yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I, I think we're in the early days. I mean, the, the work that worker centers have done for the past 20 years has been great. Um, nonprofit worker centers that really provide a sort of community organizing model for workers. Um, but I think that 
there is so much more we can be trying. That doesn't mean that like it'll be hopeless for 10 to 15 years and then we'll figure it out. Uh, we're gonna, things move a lot faster now. Um, and I think that uh, if we're open to it and we're able to see what's possible, um, we're gonna spend the next five to 10 years inventing a number of new forms and it's gonna be a really exciting moment. Um, and that uh, we will probably never again land on one thing. I hope we don't land on one thing, but that we'll land on a series of things that fit in different situations and they'll be at different phases of growth. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're in the early days. Uh, there aren't a lot of people uh, who are actively doing alternative organizing and alternative representation yet, but there are a lot of people who are excited about it that I get to talk to. Um, and I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see just this explosion and activity of experimentation and what a good time to be doing this work. What do you think about efforts to take this new kind of work and stuff it into the old kind of model of doing things or classification? So for example, you know, taking the Uber driver, for example, and saying, oh, that's that's a full-time employee under the old kind of system. Let's push them in there and kind of that or, or, or other kind of comparable kind of moves. Given where you can see the possibilities going forward, is that a kind of a step backward or is that a kind of thing to be avoided at some level and it, as opposed to going forward to a new kind of classification system? Something yeah, I mean, I think it's regulatory whack-a-mole. I mean, so you, so you solve, you solve it, for one group of workers, but the changes in the economy are structural. Um, and this is going to continue to, co to come up. And so I really do think that what we should be focusing on is this um, long term, really rethinking, broadening the definition, the narrowing always excludes people. And if we want as many people as possible to be protected and to have good lives and to make good money, then we need to expand the system, not contract people into the existing Set up. And that's what we hear from drivers, you know, Uber drivers are what we consistently hear from our community and we survey them and pull them a lot is that they, they are concerned about their wages and fare cuts. They are concerned about the tipping policy. They are concerned about the safety. They are not really worried as much about the classification question. They want to get paid. They want to be protected. Um, and they, you know, they, they're not, it's not the most important issue to them. So we need to figure out how the system meets their needs, not how we force them to meet the needs of the system. So go forward rather than back. I mean, there is, and there's a lot of other examples of this, um, you know, for let's say the home sharing environment, they're saying, well, you know, the hotels, we had this thing, or you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta do this kind of thing because the hotels do this thing. I mean, in your opinion, is that the wrong way forward? It's rather think of the next, some third thing that's kind of different from, from both? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that we need to, you know, in the hotel industry, um, I, I would say um, the good thing about some of the hotel regulations is that it does keep people safe. It does create a framework through which they are contributing back economically to the to the greater good through taxes and i think that 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 the sort of bones of that structure makes sense but that we need to figure out how that is shaped in a different way um, based on the different ways in which people are are doing home sharing and and make it work for for more folks do you have any thoughts on that specifically or no do you have any specific thoughts on that or is that just generally generically you're thinking just generally and generically i mean i think you know I, um, yeah, I, I don't know enough about uh, the system to know for sure, but I think people should be able to let out rooms in their homes. To, and I use, I use Airbnb a lot when I'm traveling. Um, I think we need to figure out how to, how to allow that for people. Um, and I also think we need to figure out how we make sure that, um, that companies uh, platforms that are creating that situation um, are contributing back to the civic space. So if we can figure out how to do both those things, I don't think we need to regulate it like a hotel. 
Okay, final kind of final question, or among the final, let's say. Um, like I say, a lot of the folks that we're talking to, we have a thinking of an audience of, of people running cities or government people running. You could think of it as state and federal level too, but mm -hmm. in general, a lot of the folks are you know they're grappling with this new kind of economy. It's hitting their cities differently. They're trying to figure out do we push them in the old direction? Do we class them? How do we do that? Do we, how do we figure this out? If you had to give advice. From your perspective, uh, but by the way, I would say a lot of folks would think, "Oh, the I think I, I'm just I've heard from other people. You know, some people just neutrally don't understand the situation. Would think, "Oh, workers are not for this thing." That so I gotta I gotta kind of stick up for workers. But I, I'm given that you're coming from the workers' spot. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give in, to kind of someone who's you know running us or part of running a small city in America here? Um, for that matter, other parts of the world, but basically just uh, going forward the next few years here, any th last thoughts on how you, what advice you give? I mean, I, I think that um, the, the advice that I always give to everyone is figure out the best way to listen to workers um, and to do that in an, in, uh, an unfiltered way. Um, which means you are sitting down with representatives of multiple constituencies that you are creating space for workers to tell you exactly what's happening in their lives um, and, to, uh, and to do it in a way where you're not presenting an either or binary framework, but really like start with what are the things that you need for your life to be better? What are the ways in which we create stability for you? Um, and to use that as the framework through which you create policy. I feel like the way that we, that companies talk to workers, that government talks to workers, that, that advocacy organizations talk to workers, is that they say, it's either this thing or that thing, and you should pick between the two. And then we don't create space for people to actually assert their needs first, and then design around that. So... If I were running a city, I would be really thoughtful about the way I'm engaging people and asking questions about um, their sense of what's possible and their sense of what they want. Because uh, I think you're not going to hear, I hate this and I want this to go away. You're also not going to hear, I love this and thanks for the flexibility. You're going to hear something in between. And it's probably going to be the seeds of the things that you actually need to be doing. Well, that's a great way to, I think, finish what was a fantastic uh, interview. I really learned a lot. I really enjoyed talking with you, and uh, I think it was quite a enlightening kind of conversation. So thank you for taking time for that. Thank you. Thanks. This was great. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Well, this is the end of a one more interview that's actually helping piece together the puzzle of the emerging sharing economy and how we can make it work for everyone. Thank you.